My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. We're going to talk about Taiwan and its early history. I did a podcast at the beginning of December of last year on Chiu Feng Jia, and I, I said I was going to try and incorporate more Taiwanese stuff into the podcast. I'm seeking to do that now. I just finished teaching a course on Taiwanese literature and film. Uh, I'll be drawing on that much more in the following probably year or so. That's actually another thing. In news of the podcast, I just this week turned in grades. I'm so happy. I'm so relieved to be done with teaching for a little while. I don't know if I'll get the opportunity to teach again. It was really, really fun, but also very draining. This quarter, I taught two classes, each about an hour and a half long, but it really became a full-time job. Okay, let's turn to the podcast. The work that we are looking at today, it's a work from the late 1600s. The author is named Yu Yonghe. The work has been translated into English. It was translated into English in 2004. I'll post a link to that translation and to the original on the, the website. The English title is Small Sea Travel Diaries. Now, I said this is Taiwan's early history. And this is a book written in the 1690s, something like that. Yu Yonghe travels to Taiwan in 1697. I know a lot of y'all are thinking, hang on, wait a second. I heard something someone recently repeat again and again at a press conference in Beijing. They mentioned about 228 times that Taiwan has long eternally been a part of China. And China is has one of the longest written traditions in the world. Writing in China goes back to about 12 or 1300 BC. So 1600 AD, that, that can't be right. That can't be the earliest, the earliest history we have of, of Taiwan. Okay, let's walk things back a little so that I can answer that question. Taiwan is an island about the size of Belgium. It lies 90 miles off of mainland Asia's coast, just across from the province of Fujian. Today, Mandarin is the main language of the island. It's a very Chinese island. Uh, so, of course, it's easy to think that it has always been Chinese. All of that makes sense. But here is the cold, hard truth. Before around 1500, there's almost no Han Chinese folks on the island of Taiwan. Let me repeat that because I know it's a very controversial statement. Before around 1550, there were almost no Han Chinese people on the island of Taiwan. How do we know that? Archaeology. In the digs in Taiwan that have been done over the past couple of decades, we see almost no Chinese products on the island. Now, this doesn't really make any sense. Taiwan is right there off the Chinese coast, and the Fujian and Fujianese people are amazing sailors. They were, by this time, starting to colonize parts of Southeast Asia. We have clear archaeological evidence of Chinese trade goods in Luzon, the main island in what is today the Philippines. Chinese traders are traveling to Japan. You have these Chinese treasure ships traveling all the way to East Africa, for crying out loud. They must have gone to Taiwan, right? Nope. There's very little evidence that Chinese people went to Taiwan. It doesn't make any sense. Taiwan is right there. It's just across the water. But that is the evidence that we have. Some people will point to texts from the Three Kingdoms about 1,700 years ago. Some leaders sent out people in boats. They go off somewhere. They come back. Did they go to Taiwan? We don't really know. You know, some nationalists in Beijing today point to that as evidence that, that Taiwan was a part of China, but it's, it's very weak evidence. Usually, these kinds of texts that Chinese nationalists point to as evidence for, for China's control of Taiwan are vaguer than election year promises made by politicians. The Three Kingdoms texts that uh, are pointed to don't use the name Taiwan. They describe somewhere using the term Liu Chou, the Chinese name for today that actually refers to the archipelago of Okinawa. So it's not really clear that these texts were actually about people going to Taiwan. We have a Song Dynasty text that describes an island that kind of sounds like Taiwan. If I had to put my money on it personally, I would say that the Song Dynasty text does refer to Taiwan, but it's hard to know. There's the history of the Yuan Dynasty. It's one of the, the dynastic histories. It refers to an island that kind of seems like Taiwan, but the thing about it is it says <laughs> no one knows anything about it because no Chinese people go there. So even those texts in Chinese that do talk about Taiwan usually point out that Chinese people don't go there. 
The first written record that we have, that we know, that we are certain, refers to Taiwan. It's actually not written in Chinese. It's written in Portuguese. The Portuguese in 1544 land on Taiwan. They name the island Ilha Formosa. Beautiful island. The earliest record that we have in Chinese that we know is referring to Taiwan. We are certain that it is referring to Taiwan. That doesn't come until 1603. A guy named Chen Di writes this piece called Dong Fan Ji, the records of the Eastern barbarians. Chen Di is a government official. He retires. He's just hanging out at his home in the province of Fujian, just there across the Taiwan Straits from the island of Taiwan. And he hears that this guy in the government, General Shun, is going to take some boats and bring the smack down on some Japanese pirates based in Taiwan who are harassing Chinese shipping. Chen Di says, hey, can I tag along? And General Shun actually lets him come. He writes it's not really a book. It's almost like two or three pages worth of writing. This this text called the Dong Fan Ji, the Records of the Eastern Barbarians. I can put a link to it in the podcast. In 1603, this is published, and it's the first time we have a clear record of a, of a Chinese person writing something down about Taiwan that they actually personally visited themselves. Earlier stuff, it probably refers to Taiwan, but it's unclear, and also it's not actually clear if any Chinese folks actually visited the island. It's not clear where these writers before 1603 are getting their information. So 1603, we know the record is clear. Chen Di is definitely going to Taiwan. He lands on the island. He describes the indigenous inhabitants of the island. I know it seems crazy, but it's not until this point that we have anybody who clearly landed on Taiwan. Taiwan's just across the water from Fujian. How could they not have gone there? How could Chinese folks who are sailing to Japan, to Korea, to the Philippines, they're sailing there regularly. How could they not have gone to Taiwan? A couple of things to keep in mind. Chinese sailors and Chinese captains don't write things down very much. Most Chinese sailors are illiterate. They don't read. They don't write. Now, this is a little different from the Western explorers who issue forth from Europe in the early Renaissance and conquer a bunch of stuff. We have their records. They wrote down what they saw, what they did. We know how they got there. So that may be one of the reasons that European exploration is different from China. But keep in mind, this isn't all that different from Western explorers. The Western explorers, they wrote down what they did. People like John Cabot. Cabot is there exploring Newfoundland and other parts of what is today Canada. Cabot and others get there. And you know what's strange? When they arrive in North America, they actually find some of the indigenous folks there speaking English. Now, how did they learn to speak English? Were the indigenous people of Newfoundland learning English by using Duolingo? No, obviously not. Well, of course, English captains had long been going to the coast of North America, fishing cod off the shores of Newfoundland and trading with the indigenous people. But they didn't write that down. So we know that explorers like Cabot were there, but we don't know how long this trade between English small-scale entrepreneurial sellers and the indigenous people in North America, we don't know how long that had been going on. Uh, so China's situation is probably something like that. You probably had Chinese folks going to Taiwan in small numbers for, for fishing, for trading, for something like that, but not much trading because, again, the archaeological evidence suggests that very few people, very few Chinese folks were there. We have really very little sign of Chinese goods there in Taiwan. Another reason that Chinese folks probably didn't go to Taiwan, there's this real hatred of sea travel by Chinese folks, particularly the elite. Usually, if you were elite in China, you didn't deign to travel overseas. If you were high class enough to be able to write and read Wen Yanwen, classical Chinese, you're probably not traveling overseas. There is this ethnocentricity there. Why would you, if you have the social standing to read and write, why wouldn't you just stay in China? You have Chinese folks who are traveling outside of China, but usually they're the lower class folks. They're not writing stuff down, whether or not it's because they are illiterate or, or what. We don't really know. One of the reasons we don't have any records of Taiwan in Chinese until 1603 is probably just because some folks were going there, but they didn't write things down. Another reason we don't have a clear record of Taiwan in Chinese, the Taiwanese indigenous people aren't really nice and welcoming. Now, what do I mean by not nice? So headhunting was an important religious practice that many indigenous groups in Taiwan practiced. They believed that to cross the Rainbow Bridge to get access to the good things in the afterlife, 
you have to kill someone and take their head. Heads of one's enemies become a status symbol. People would hang the heads of folks that they had killed outside their house. They would use those heads as pillows. I don't have a PhD in anthropology, but it strikes me that the Taiwanese indigenous folks might not have been super welcoming of foreigners landing on their soil and saying, hey, we are from China. What do you want to trade with us for this awesome porcelain that we have developed here in China? This is just speculation, but it's well-informed speculation. Those are two reasons that that we have really very little evidence of Chinese folks on the island of Taiwan before 1550. Now, here's a really brief history of Taiwan from that first contact in the 1550s to the point where we have Yu Yonghe writing down what he sees. If you want something a bit more in-depth, check out Laszlo Montgomery's series on Taiwanese history. I'll drop a link to that in this episode's uh, page as well at ChineseLiteraturePodcast.com. So there are a few Chinese folks coming to Taiwan in the 1550s, 1560s, that period for the next uh, 70 some odd years. In the 1620s, Taiwan is conquered by not the Chinese, but the Dutch. They rule Taiwan until the 1660s. They have a colony there based in what's today Tainan. Um, of course, all of y'all know that in 1644, something really important happens in China, the Ming Dynasty collapses, and the Qing Dynasty takes over. One Ming loyalist, uh, his name in, in English and the rest of the West is usually Koxinga, but in Chinese he's named uh, Zheng Chenggong. He is fighting the Qing along the southeastern Chinese coast. In 1659, he tries to invade Nanjing near modern-day Shanghai. His invasion fails spectacularly. He's forced to retreat back to his base there in Fujian, right across the water from Taiwan. What does he do? He recognizes that the Qing is probably going to defeat him now that he's lost. He gambled it all on this inv attempt to, to take Nanjing. Now he has to retreat. He retreats to Taiwan and takes the island from the Dutch. Koxinga and his family rule Taiwan from the 1660s up to 1683. And then the Qing dynasty gets their act together and they invade Taiwan taking the last of the rulers of the Koxinga regime. It's a fairly peaceful invasion, relatively peaceful. There's always the threat of violence, but the Qing and the regime on Taiwan kind of make a deal, and there's very little bloodshed. So the Qing captured Taiwan. They're not sure what they want to do with it. The Kangxi emperor, he calls Taiwan just a, quote, ball of mud, end quote. Why would Kangxi want to keep this little ball of mud. Some in the Qing wanted to give Taiwan up, but Admiral Shilong, he's the man who conquered Taiwan, he says, hey, if we give it up, some barbarians are just going to come and take it and threaten us from Taiwan. So rather than giving up Taiwan, the Qing actually takes control of the island and decides to keep it. Uh, but it has this amb ambiguous r relationship with Taiwan all the way really until 1895 when the Qing give up Taiwan. That's a super brief outline of Taiwanese history just to bring you all up to speed to where our text comes in. Yu Yonghe. Who is Yu Yonghe? We really have almost no information on him. He was born before 1650, but we don't know when. He is from an area right outside of Hangzhou. We don't know when he died. We have almost no information on him other than the things he wrote down in this book, The Small Sea Travel Diaries. We don't know what his profession was, but we do know he knew lots of government officials and that he was very well off financially. Yu Yonghe was almost uniquely interested in foreign cultures. Like I said, China's literary elites, the folks in government, the folks who were able to read and write, rarely traveled overseas unless they were forced to. Yu Yonghe is different. Yu Yonghe actually liked to travel. Here is a line from his book where he talks about his love of travel, and this is my own rough translation. Quote, I am one who gets off on traveling to faraway places. I don't duck obstacles or dangers. It is often said that Taiwan has come onto the map. Thus, I must go take a look at it. Otherwise, I will not be happy. It's pretty clear that Yu Yonghe like travel, just from this quote, but just to point out another piece of evidence. His rap name. Remember, most Chinese elites, they have a name that they're given at birth, but they will, will also usually choose another name for themselves, kind of like a rap name. You know, a rap name is a name that rappers adopt as their stage persona. Yu Yonghe's is this author's real name, but his rap name is Tang Lang, 
or Blue Wave. So there's no surprise here that he's one of the first Chinese elites to take to the ocean and go to Taiwan. Now there's Yu Yonghe's love of travel. That's one reason he goes to Taiwan. But another reason is very specific. In 1696, he's there in Fuzhou on the Fujian East Coast, and there's a major explosion in Fuzhou's gunpowder stores. Fujianese officials are like, we're out of gunpowder. We need to get some gunpowder quick. And they send Yu Yonghe to go and mine up some sulfur in the wilds of northern Taiwan. Based off my reading of the text that Yu Yonghe wrote, it's pretty clear that at least one of the places he goes to is Beitou. Beitou is now a major hot springs resort area that's only about a 30-minute subway ride from the center of Taipei. But back then, it was the middle of this unmapped wilderness. Yu Yonghe writes this travelogue. He goes to Taiwan. He writes it all down in this diary form. Yu is one of the first travelers in China to use this form of the detailed diary to create his travelogue. He goes in 1697. The trip is pretty rough. He has to travel by boat across the Black Ditch, the Heishui Go. This is a part of the Taiwan Straits that is really hairy. It has the Kuroshio current pulsing northwards that's similar to in the Atlantic. You have the Gulf Stream. The Kuroshiro current brings warm water up the west coast of the Pacific. Part of it passes through the Taiwan Strait, and it's quite dangerous. It has this black water from the south. Here is what Yu Yonghe says about crossing the Black Ditch. I'm using Kelleher Macab's translation from 2004. We crossed the Black Ditch, the most dangerous part of the Taiwan seas. The ocean water is clear and green, while that of the ditch is black as ink. Here it is also deeper, which is why it is known as the ditch. At about 100 li wide, its swirling waters flow swiftly and a foul odor bubbles forth to greet you. Also, red and black striped snakes and two-headed snakes swim around the ship. The helmsman throws an oar at the snake. It freezes and does not move, fearing it will be sucked south in the current. Then it is gone. No one knows where it went. So quite a harrowing passage to Taiwan. Uh, Yu Yonghe gets across the Black Ditch. He lands in what's then called Taiwan Fu. It's the seat of the Taiwanese government. Today it's called Tainan. Yu gets there and there's a very limited amount of Qing officials there. They are there, but they are very scared, and they rarely leave Tainan. They are too afraid to leave Tainan. In fact, Taiwan is administratively divided into three units at this point. One administration rules the north, one rules the middle there in Tainan, and one rules the south, roughly around modern-day Kaohsiung. But all of them live there in Tainan because the people in charge of the administrative units outside of Tainan, they are so scared of living amongst these barbarians in these barbarian wild areas that they they don't leave Tainan. So Yu Yonghe shows up and he's like, I'm going to go up north and get some sulfur. And the government officials are like, are you crazy? Don't do that. How does Yu Yonghe respond? He says, look, I was born. I know I'm going to die. God, deci- God decides when those things happen. What can water and land do to me? I've thought it through, and I'm going. So he travels up north by road. Initially, he thinks the sea route is dangerous. He comments throughout his travels on the aboriginal Taiwanese man who's a cart driver and how disgusting and unhuman he is. What does Yu Yonghe find most disgusting about him? It's the tattoos that cover this aboriginal Taiwanese man. Tattooing was an important part of Aboriginal and Taiwanese culture, but the Chinese hated it. What does Yu Yonghe think of these barbarians? At some point, he clearly despises them. That much is clear, but it's not clear how much he considers them humans. Most Chinese writers at this time would not have considered Aboriginal and Taiwanese folks to be fully human. At times, Yu Yonghe seems to be of this same opinion. At times, he says, No one lives here. Only barbarians live here. It's just too dangerous. So in that, he suggests that he does not consider the barbarians fully human. There are other passages that suggest something similar. There's a passage where at one point Yu Yonghe is deep in the mountains and he encounters a very human-like ape. He calls them apes. 
talks about them as if they're apes. He doesn't say they're humans. He just says they look a lot like humans, but they're apes. The only problem is there are no apes that live in Taiwan other than Homo sapiens. There are only small monkeys that live in Taiwan. In this passage, it seems clear he must be talking about these Taiwanese aboriginals who live deep in the mountains, but Yu Yonghe is convinced they're not humans. They're actually apes. So all of that suggests that Yu Yonghe is part of this racist vein in Chinese thinking that considers all non-Chinese folks to be somehow subhuman. But then there are these other passages where he's surprisingly sympathetic to the Taiwanese aboriginals in a way that I think marks Yu Yonghe out as different from other folks. So Yu Yonghe criticizes other Chinese writers who say, you know what, these Taiwanese folks, they're not humans, they're animals. Yu Yonghe says, no, that's not correct. Yu Yonghe says, there are a lot of Chinese people who point out that these aborigines do not wear much in terms of clothing. Therefore, they must not feel cold like a normal human being. Yu Yonghe says, no, that's nonsense. If you actually go and talk to them, you'll find that they do feel cold, that they do want to wear clothes. They just don't have the economic means to buy clothes. Yu Yonghe says, these barbarians are stupid. And that's his word, not mine. He, he uses the word stupid. But Yu Yonghe also says, we can teach them. All they really need to become like us is these traditional Confucian texts. The Book of Poetry, the Book of Rites. I've done a podcast on the Book of Poetry, but not on the Book of Rites. I'll, I'll link to the, the podcast on the Book of Poetry. A lot of links in this podcast. So Yu Yonghe says, Look, we can educate them. We can make them into fully-fledged humans, that is, fully-fledged Chinese folks. He thinks it'll probably take either at a minimum of 30 years or at a maximum of 100 years. But we can turn them into normal people, just like Chinese folks. He points out that, yes, these barbarians are frightening with their tattoos, but he also notes that back in the day, the people of Wu and the people of Yue, where modern-day Shanghai and Guangdong are, they also had tattoos, and now that they have read the Book of Poetry and the Book of Rites, they've become some of the smartest people in the world. They understand these Confucian texts better than anyone else. So there's a, a lot to unpack here. This racist strain of thinking says that pretty much only we Chinese are capable of being smart. Only we are capable of being civilized. And in this way, the Chinese aren't all that different from other folks like the Greeks and the Romans who said anyone who's different from us, they're stupid. They're less than us. But there's this other strain of thinking in Chinese thought. In this other strain, they still think that their culture is the most important in the world. But they're what we would call universalist. They think that anyone can aspire to be part of this great culture. All you have to do to be smart is learn the Chinese classics. It doesn't matter who your parents were. You can learn to read Confucius. You can learn to read the Book of Poetry, the Book of Rites, and then you will become morally cultivated. Whether or not your parents were barbarians, you can become civilized. Now, I don't mean to say this is a politically correct perspective that Yu Yonghe has. Lots of people today would find this uh, second position problematic. No no questions asked. But it's very different from the, the sort of genetic determinist racism that other folks in China uh, that Yu Yonghe is responding to. It's very different from that strain of thinking. And and I think it's, I'll just say it, I think it's much more, more positive. It's much more open to change, even if there are still some things that I would personally be like, mm, I, I'm pretty critical of that point. Okay, I've babbled on way too long already. That is a very brief discussion of Yu Yonghe and his small sea travel diary. I'm going to put links to the translation by McCabe Kelleher. He's a professor at Southern Methodist, Southern Methodist University. I'll also put a link to Laszlo Montgomery's Taiwan series and some of the other things. I will also put a link to Laszlo Montgomery's Taiwan series over at the excellent China History Podcast. Check both of those out. I'm going to put those on the website, ChineseLiteraturePodcast.com. Um, while you are there, make sure to sign up to pre-order my forthcoming book, China's Backstory, the Literature and History Behind Today's Front Page China News. You don't need a credit card. Just give my publishers that thing that's even more precious than your credit card, that is, your email address. We've talked about this. We agreed we're not going to spam you I talked to them, and one of the publishers asked me if I wanted to do an email blast with a snippet from the book that I've already written, and we decided it's better to hold off until we're closer to publication, just so that y'all don't feel like we're oversending emails to y'all. So check that out. Sign up for my forthcoming book, China's Backstory. There's a link right there on the webpage. That's it for me. My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.